It is one o'clock, so we will go ahead and get started. Um, welcome everyone. Thank you for uh, joining us for Compassion, Fatigue and Burnout with Katie Rowe I'm here with the Illinois Crisis Prevention Network. Um, my name is Danielle. I'm the Professional Development Coordinator here at the Illinois Crisis Prevention Network. I'm gonna go over a few housekeeping items and then Katie will go ahead and um, begin the presentation. Um, we will run until 2.30 today. You are um, muted, your cameras are disabled. Um, the only way to interact throughout is through that chat box. Um, you can also use the Q&A to ask questions. Also, I will do my best to monitor as we go through. Um, there may be a little bit of time at the end to, to finish answering some questions, but if you have questions throughout, please be sure to throw those in the chat box or the Q&A. We'll try to get to them as we go along, um, or we will get to them at the end. Um, please visit our website, icpn.org. You can view our upcoming webinars as well as review some of our past web webinars. Um, there is a link to our YouTube channel. All of our webinars are recorded and added to that YouTube within a few weeks of a webinar. We have a couple that are on the website. Um, coming up October 9th, we have Self-Care It's Not Selfish. And October 23rd, we have Uniting Expertise, Building Powerful Interdisciplinary Teams for Person-Centered Support. Uh, so we're really looking forward to those. Please be sure to check those out and register. Um, registration is open. Um, as a reminder, we did send out a, um, a an email blast um, a couple weeks back now, and um, I reminded people on our previous webinar last um, last week. We actually had one of our webinars also, but um, all webinars moving forward are going to include a post exam um, that will need to be completed in order to receive a certificate. Um, so. Hopefully technology will work out in our favor today and you will receive that post exam right after the webinar, after everything has synced. Um, if that is not the case, I do apologize that it might take a couple of days to get that out to you, but please be patient with me. Um, technology has not been working perfectly for this, um, but hopefully you will receive it after the webinar. Um, please note, it does say something about a survey, but in the email it says that in order to, um, that if you're taking the webinar, you've um, viewed the webinar for CE credit, you may have to do this survey. That survey is what you need to complete in order to receive your certificate. Um, so that being said, make sure that you have independently registered for a webinar. You cannot use another person's link because then you are not accounted for. That person is accounted for because each link is unique to the person that receives it. So register with your own email address. Um, you are not allowed to view a webinar with another person and then ask for a certificate after the fact. You must have um, registered for a webinar to receive a certificate. We also, due to this, um, we're not able to take call-in um, anymore. So um, if you're calling in, you are no longer able to receive a certificate. So I know that's a lot um, and I know it's a change, but please bear with us as um, as we're getting comfortable and used to that change. Um, so as, rem as a reminder, just make sure that you've registered and you've clicked on your own link for the webinar. You will receive the post exam. I know some people are still, um, I see in the chat box, some people have not gotten it yet. If you have not gotten it from last week, email me. Um, like I said, there was a lot of technological issues in getting that to people. Um, um, if you send me an email, I can resend the link to you um, to make sure that you're able to get your certificate. Um, I think that that is all I have. Like I said, I know that's a lot of information. I'll try to throw that into the chat box now and then after the fact um, so that you have that information. If at any point in time you have any questions or concerns, you're more than welcome to reach out to me. I will also put my email address into the chat box, um, but it is the email address where all of your email blasts come from. So it is my first letter of my first name, um, D, my last name, daily at hope.us. Um, again, thank you for bearing with us as we are navigating all of these changes. Um, I think that is all I have, Katie, if you want to go ahead and get started. Hey, hello, everybody. Um, so thanks for joining us today. And um, we'll talk a little bit about um, compassion fatigue for those of us supporting um individuals and caregiving. Um, just to start out, um, wanting to get a little feedback from you guys um, about what your beliefs are and what your experience has been um, 
regarding compassion fatigue? Like what are your experiences as far as some of the symptoms or observations you've made? Um, <clears throat> yep, it does happen to everyone. Um, apathy, that's good. My goodness, yes. Lack of energy, irritability, overwhelmed, caring more about the person you're serving than they care about themselves. That's tough. Um, definitely guilt, frustration. Absolutely. Those are all very good. Draining emotionally and mentally. Depression, low energy. Yep. You guys know it. Um, and I think, um, having said, you know, about going through, um, COVID, it definitely, um, increased a lot of that, um, level of, um, fatigue and, and burnout that we experience. So, um, thank you for sharing. I think everybody already has kind of a good grasp. So we'll kind of go over, um, some ideas for being able to cope better and also a little bit more <clears throat> of being able to decipher between um, certain aspects. So um, the difference between compassion fatigue, um, secondary trauma, secondary traumatic stress and burnout. So um, as it says here um, that there's, you know, slight differences, but they all kind of go into the same little general area. Um, compassion fatigue, um, a lot of people um, who are caregivers and working in the caregiving field, um, providing that support to individuals um, are most likely to experience compassion fatigue. Um, healthcare providers are um, impacted by the stress of meeting the overwhelming needs of patients and their families. So um, I know that we have a diverse group of individuals here um, who work in very different um, settings. So a lot of this is kind of universal for caregivers um, and service providers. Um, and then, so when we're talking about healthcare providers or like certain aspects, it's really kind of universal for all kind of caregiving support services. Um, secondary traumatic stress, um, STS refers to distress and emotional disruption resulting from continued contact or after a single exposure with individuals who have directly experienced trauma. So compassion fatigue and secondary traumatic stress, you can see the difference there where compassion fatigue is that fatigue of caregiving. Traumatic stress is that secondary trauma of um, seeing what they're going through, seeing, um, hearing their stories or, you know, the trauma that they've been through, um, witnessing their suffering, um, observing, um, you know, some of the traumatic experiences, um, abuse, neglect, um, bullying, things that people experience. Um, burnout, the long-term stress reaction and process that occurs among prof professionals who work with people in some capacity. Um, and then, which you guys have already kind of touched on in the chat box, some of the things that add to, um, you know, these compassion fatigue and um, stressors is, you know, being short staffed, having an impossible caseload of people to take care of. Um, and then, you know, having less quality of, of time and care to give to those that you're serving. Um, and then having a high level of need for the people that you're working with and fewer resources to provide them with. Um, watching others suffer without being able to help, not knowing what's wrong, trying to figure out how can I help this person? What ideas do we have? How can we be creative? Um, and then, you know, kind of being shot down again and again where nothing seems to work. You can't figure out this mystery of what is wrong with this person. 
Um, and also environmentally, you know, if you have coworkers who are, you know, feeling fatigued themselves or being negative, that can definitely add to, you know, your ability to cope in, you know, your environment of work. Um, and then also coworkers who kind of already, you know, tapped out, like they don't care as much. They don't put their energy into their job. They're not really, you know, necessarily team players or, you know, a supportive person um, working amongst the, um, the agency. And, you know, it's kind of like a wildfire, you know, um, burnout can spread. It's, um, it's something that, amongst all coworkers, um, it can affect each other. Um, another, hi. We just had someone ask if, um, if you have seen any statistics on the number of caregivers who have traumatic pasts and how that can impact mm -hmm. them as a caregiver, which I thought was a great question. That is a great question. Um, that is not something that I have come across, but I think that that is very, um, important to consider, you know, how, um, those that we serve and the experiences that we have are, you know, we're triggered by those that we're serving, you know, um, you know, what's a good example. Um, I'll, I'll sh share like a personal thing where, you know, um, I had, like my mother had health issues and my family was helping to care for her. And then I was working with, um, you know, some older individuals in my job and going to visit them um, kind of triggered some of those emotions of when I had been caring with for my mom when she was ill before she passed. So like we carry it with us, you know, we always, we try to separate and have those boundaries, but absolutely it can trigger different things in us. It brings up emotions or, you know, um, memories and that's very relevant. So, um, but that's an, a very good statement and something to look into. Um, so vicarious trauma, um, you know, similar to secondary um, traumatic stress, the um, they define, the American Counseling Association defines it as the emotional residue of exposure to traumatic stories and experiences of others. So witnessing their um, fear, pain, um, and terror, and um, kind of, you know, having that carry along with you, you know, um, they having that preoccupation, they say, which is um, a really good definition, I feel like. And secondary trauma is um, refer to symptoms that occur after hearing or witnessing someone else's trauma on one occasion, whereas vicarious trauma is like symptoms that develop over time um, in response to long-term exposure to many different people's pain. Um, so kind of, as I mentioned, those who are bull bullied or neglected, struggling with family issues, medical trauma, um, or those who've been, you know, abused in their past, verbally, physically, um, and and sexually. Okay. So stages of compassion fatigue. Um, so this was interesting to me. I didn't realize kind of how in depth everything goes. Um, the Z lot phase, um, when a person is, you know, starting out more, you know, they're fresh and green and they're passionate and excited and they feel like, you know, I'm going to change the world and I'm going to make a difference. And um, they are eager and committed and ready to, you know, do their best. And then it kind of, um, you know, as we're kind of going down, fading, feeling um, less enthusiastic, um, kind of following, um, avoiding work responsibilities. Um, they're doing their job, but probably not going above and beyond like they had previously. Um, and they're making careless mistakes or, um, you know, not really connecting with others as they previously had. Um, and then withdrawal is no feeling, not feeling passionate. Um, the line between personal life and caretaking responsibility blurs. Um, and 
that's a lack of boundaries, which we'll get into later on a little bit more. Um, and feeling irritable and probably a little bit resentful towards those um, that you're caring for. Um, and just detachment, you know, not not wanting to feel um, emotional. Someone brought up apathy in the chat box earlier, and that's absolutely, um, I think, part of this phase. Um, the zombie phase, um, the caregiver uh, continues to distance themselves. Um, they feel depressed and despondent, maybe angry and resentful, um, and maybe, you know, not getting along with their coworkers or those that they're caring for, um, and spreading that negativity. So, um, that was an interesting way that they, um, kind of categorize those. Um, and I'll say like, I feel like over the years in different roles, um, personally, like I've worked in, you know, um, different social work roles as case managers, um, in child welfare. And then I've been here with ICPN for about seven years and I've had, you know, really wonderful coworkers. Um, and we all have our ups and downs and we all kind of go through our different things, but overall, I think that we, um, are able to support each other and it makes a huge difference in who you work with and the support you give, um, being able to check in with each other and support each other. Um, I'll say, you know, like I, I'm lucky I have a lot of family support and I have, you know, a lot of people who are interested in my job because our jobs are pretty interesting and, you know, unique, um, especially at ICPN. You know, we go a lot of different places across Northern Illinois for the Rockford office anyways, all across Illinois for, you know, all the other offices too. But um, we see a lot of different, places and we're kind of seeing people at their worst. They're struggling behaviorally, medically, um, you know, dealing with mental health issues and um, all kinds of things. And other people outside of, you know, my work environment don't understand like what we go through every day. Not only can we not really share it because of, you know, privacy concerns, but trying to explain it is like so um, beyond like their ability to understand. So having good coworkers who you can talk about cases with and these individuals that we're trying to support, it is a huge, um, I think, comfort. And um, it really makes it so you get you through your day. So um, I feel very lucky in that way. Um, and um, yeah, self-awareness and prioritizing um, yourself. And, um, I'll share more about some of my experiences as going through compassion fatigue later on too. Um, so often professions that are commonly uh, susceptible, um, caregivers, professional and family caregivers, which, and direct care staff, of course, um, you know, all of, um, the individuals that we work with and agencies and going into family homes, you know, it's everybody's kind of in a crisis, which, you know, a crisis means different things to different people, which kind of depends on like your level of tolerance and what you can handle and what, you know, supports you have in place. So, um, but usually oftentimes when we are coming in to support them, they're in their own level of crisis. And, um, so it's, you know, it's tough. And um, so healthcare industry workers, doctors, nurses, and, you know, I was kind of like thinking about some of these, I was like, yeah, veterinarians. I mean, man, like seeing, even just watching a movie with like animals getting hurt in it, like can just be very, you know, heart wrenching. And um, of course, you know, child protection, those um, working in child welfare, therapists kind of hearing all of the trauma and stuff that um people go through teachers um police officers and paramedics um i was when it, making this list and kind of putting some of this stuff together i was like surprised with journalists but i was like yeah that makes sense you know um going around um especially you know um 
going abroad and witnessing, you know, war or anything like that and gathering stories from people. You know, there's so many, so many jobs that people are exposed to tough emotions and um, witnessing or experiencing difficult things. So, um, and um, kind of wanting to get some feedback from everybody because everybody here is some kind of a caregiver service provider who is in the helping profession, right? Um, so just kind of thinking like, what kind of responsibilities do you carry in your workload? And, um, and what do you think are common characteristics for caregivers? And if you would throw some of your answers in the chat box, then we can um, kind of get an idea. Um, patience, advocacy, empathy, flexibility, compassion, positivity, a lot of patience, absolutely. Um, case management, boundaries, attentiveness, love of people, yes. Um, yes, all very good safety, attention to detail. Absolutely, those are all good. Dependability, multitasking, absolutely. Um, safety, health, so many responsibilities, right? Like, I mean, I think probably everybody wears multiple different hats and so many roles. Um, many selfless leading to poor self-care. Hmm. Yeah. So that's kind of the boundary thing that we'll talk about too a little bit later. Thank you. Thank you all for, um, for adding your perspective. Um, so some of the things that come to mind um, when I was kind of thinking about this is, you know, do you worry about your patients, clients, residents, like when you're off of work, like when you're grocery shopping, are you thinking, oh, you know, this client would like this, like, are you spending your personal money on your clients? Um, are you um, carrying that responsibility with you when you're off the clock? Um, even when, you know, you're with your family? Is it kind of still coming in in the back of your mind? Um, and so part of that goal is trying to find a balance. And here I am too, in the back of my mind, I'm like, gosh, I'm such a hypocrite. You know, <laughs> it's hard to let go. It's hard to have that boundary and balance, you know? Um, but I think it's true. And this is lifelong practice. Like we got to keep trying to, to change like our behaviors and ways of thinking to make sure that we find that balance. And um, so, but what makes a caregiver, like some of the things that I jotted down, um, they're givers, you know, um, intuitive and tuned into other people's needs. Um, and multitasker was on my list too. So those who wrote that, I feel ya. Um, having to think on your feet and make quick decisions of what's right for other people, which is really hard to do and such a huge responsibility. Um, and then being time efficient, right? Like being, um, being able to, to manage so many people's schedules and kind of take, um, into account so many different variables. Um, <clears throat> and then something else, you know, I was thinking about, like, we all are in these roles of caregivers and, um, support staff and, um, you know, experiencing some of these kind of tough and emotional situations. And then we go home and we are mothers and fathers and brothers and sisters, and we care for our, our mothers or we care for our children, or we, you know, we are caregivers like throughout so many different realms of our, our life. Right. So it, it's not easy to turn it off and we can't turn it off. So, um, you know, just throughout kind of who you are in your being, we are often, you know, caregivers in many roles. And um, so, but it comes naturally to a lot of us. So, <clears throat> um, okay. And then someone earlier had asked about statistics. 
So, um, but that was a different question, a really good one. But these are some statistics that um, we found um, just 48% uh, of the U.S. workforce experiences high levels of personal distress that is directly associated with jobs. And um, 28 of people who are working in a helping career have received some form of specialized trauma training. So I think that, and I hope that that has increased. I think that there's been a lot more talk about trauma and um, being able to consider what other people have been through and how other people's trauma may affect us and trigger us as um, people who are trying to support them. So, um, and then 81% of the workers who suffer from compassion fatigue are women. But if you look at a lot of like those jobs, it's often, um, it's often dominated. This is a field, a field that is definitely dominated by, by women. Um, <clears throat> and um, studies show that caregivers who are able to maintain a positive attitude towards life and keep a sense of humor um, can better balance the stresses. So um, compassion fatigue occurs often, though up to 70% of social workers, they show, show symptoms of secondary traumatic stress. And 70% of therapists experience some form of secondary trauma that is directly related to their to working. Um, and one in two child welfare workers experience a secondary traumatic stress. So, which is um, in the severe range, I guess. So kind of what I, what I think you would expect, you know, um, <clears throat> something to kind of consider though, is um, how <clears throat> the generations are changing and how, oh, sorry, Danielle. Hi. It's okay. I didn't <laughs> want to interrupt you. There are a couple questions that I thought maybe you okay. could speak on before you kind of move forward. Yeah. Um, we had an anonymous attendee say that they've, um, they've seen a shift in language from burnout to moral injury um, oh. being used. Um, so this person didn't know if you could discuss um, if you've seen this shift at all or how it has impacted work. I have not seen that. <clears throat> so I'm wondering, excuse me, where um, that <clears throat> had come from, moral injury. That's interesting. I did not come across that in um, my reading. <clears throat> I, excuse me, <clears throat> I did specifically look up for compassion fatigue and looking for um, you know, resources for that. And then there were a couple of books on, um, you know, related topics that I turned to. So um, I didn't, you know, research new language of what they were um, describing it as, but that's really interesting. So um, yeah, I don't know if they have more information about that, then I'd be interested to read about it, but I did not come across that. Yeah, I, I, that was the first I'd heard that also. I mean, I did obviously do a little bit of research as you were talking. Um, and obviously, you know, it's a term that's used in, um, in witnessing acts or whatever that violate a person's moral code. So um, I think that opens up a whole nother discussion, obviously, yeah. <laughs> for another day, wow. right? <laughs> yeah. Um, Something else to add on for a future. Mm -hmm. Right. Absolutely. Um, and then someone had asked too, if you could maybe explain the difference um, in the term being overworked versus compassion fatigue. Okay. Um, I would say that the, the difference would be overworked is, um, you know, when <clears throat> you're feeling overwhelmed, right? And but compassion fatigue, which we'll get into signs and symptoms, um, there are, you know, physical distress, there's emotional distress symptoms that you feel when you're experiencing compassion fatigue. So if someone is overworked, then they might, you know, feel, you know, some of the same symptoms, but um, I mean, if it could be one and the same, just depending on the language that you use. But, um, you know, I would say that 
whether or not they're experiencing symptoms would be the defining characteristic of if it is compassion fatigue or not. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, and then one last thing before you keep going. Um, mm -hmm. Lynn said, what about when a client dies and work says you just have to, you just got to get past it and keep going. She said, there's no help for anyone going through this loss at work. Oh gosh. Yeah. I, you know, I, one of the things that, um, I did another kind of training like this on grief and that is tough. I've had clients pass away as well. And that is very hard. And for the clients that have lived in, you know, the group homes with, um, you know, these friends or, you know, housemates that they've had for all these years, and then someone passes away. Um, I think, you know, in any way of supporting them, those who are grieving, those in the household, you know, doing things to help them to grieve, to, um, <clears throat> um, to honor their memory and, um, you know, putting pictures up or sharing funny memories and, um, for each individual in the house, um, trying to see, you know, ways that for them, depending on their own, you know, culture and beliefs, how they can find some sense of peace and, and comfort in their grieving process. So that's a tough one. Um, so I think that, but it also shows me like, that's wonderful that you're aware and in tune with those that, you know, you're working with that you're able to recognize they're grieving and they need some, some support and help. And, um, I think that that's wonderful and um, that you're still compassionate and not quite at the stage of ca compassion fatigue. So, um, <clears throat> so yes, I hope that that kind of um, gives a little bit of feedback for, for that comment. Um, <clears throat> so I was kind of talking about how things are shifting kind of in the, with the new generations coming in. And it seems like there's um, a lot more of a push for um, like a work-life balance and that people, you know, they talk about, you know, remote or um, remote working or um, like working four day work weeks, or, you know, there's a lot of different um, ideas floating around out there. And um, it seems like, you know, the newer generations or like, I don't know, I kind of feel like after having some conversations with some of my coworkers, even just after COVID, like I feel like the pandemic kind of changed like the perspective of work and, you know, that um, level of dedication or, um, you know, work ethic um, to a certain degree. And um, so the focus seems to be shifting a bit to where um our society like we always shown like the pride and who's there the earliest and who stays the latest and you know who works the hardest and you know um who's gonna pick up the extra shifts and who's you know sacrificing the most and um but now there's like you know work-life balance and is there satisfaction in your work are you feeling you know um, that you're appreciated? Are you feeling like if you want people to stay on longer and to work hard and to be passionate and dedicated, then there are things that agencies and jobs and environments of like a working environment need to provide to, to people for them to have that, to, to sustain that and to have those supports to, to support the workers. And, um, like they just said about, you know, um, <clears throat> being able to help those who, who are grieving and different situations that, um, that come, that arise that, um, you don't necessarily expect or plan for. Um, so, and just working smarter and not harder and trying to make things to flow better. Um, hi, Danielle. Um, Ellen, uh, discusses a little bit right in line with what you're talking about in that, 
Um, you know, we really discuss how much of burnout isn't just about the work, but about the challenge of the constant, like do more with less, uh, which is really exploiting, you know, workers. Um, mm -hmm. So work-life balance um, right now is, it can be really hard when you're not properly compensated or provided resources or empowered as an employee. Um, she didn't know if you could speak a little bit about if you've seen how um, any organizations are addressing this, if they are addressing it. Hmm. Um, you know, I'm, my kind of role is specialized to work with, um, you know, the agencies and like we go into the group homes, um, SILAs, ICFs, schools, day programs, um, family homes. Um, so, you know, I think that it is, it's a hard position because they can't necessarily, um, offer, you know, work from home, or, um, I have seen some of the agencies be a little bit, um, like, and especially like nonprofits, right? A lot of nonprofits, they're grant funded. They can't necessarily, you know, it's not a corporate, you know, situation where they're like, we'll give people raises or bonuses, you know, it's a very limited budget with funding and whatnot. So they're like, they try to give, you know, more incentives of, um, like vacation days or, you know, um, <clears throat> you know, being able to do vacation buyout to be able to, um, to use that money. If they can't take days off, then they're going to have the extra money and, or, um, you know, trying to find, um, other ways of compensating, like buying lunch for people or, you know, and I know that these aren't, you know, answers to those problems because most if not all the agencies that I have personally like been to are short-staffed there's and my teacher friends my nurse friends my brother's a nurse you know um and I have multiple teacher friends across like in different areas everybody's short-staffed you know and so it's I think within like those situations you know they try to compensate the best that they they can in certain areas but i think it's really challenging you know um other than just hiring more people and spreading out the workload i don't know you know how else to like they can kind of address it so um but yeah those are just like some of the the little things that i've observed um but yes so um okay and so I was going to kind of um, share a little bit about some of my experience personally with um, compassion fatigue. Um, before working in this position, I worked in child welfare for about 10 years um, in various different roles. And um, by the end, in like about 2017, and we talk about, you know, high case loads, um, you know, we had people leaving the agency I worked with, we had very high case loads um, and just really challenging cases, really challenging situations, you know, from, from my caseload personally, I mean, they're all challenging, but um, you know, it was, you know, beyond my window of tolerance, I'll just say that. And um, so I was experiencing burnout and compassion fatigue. And um, so some of my personal symptoms that I started to exhibit um, that made me realize I needed a change and I needed to make a change before like something really bad happened. Um, I was feeling, I was experiencing heightened anxiety, um, bad dreams, panic. Um, I was unable to maintain healthy boundaries and like between work and home, I was bringing work home, um, having you know, a sense of overwhelming responsibility, you know, laying in bed at night, you know, worrying about work kids. And then, you know, like I remember one time I was um, home with my sick daughter and then I came back to work after, you know, she was better. And my, um, my supervisor at the time, she was like, oh, how are the kids? You know, I have two kids. And 
I was like, which kids, which, you know, which family you're talking about, which, which one of the kids that I was like on my caseload, I was like, not even thinking about my own children. I was thinking about, oh my gosh, did something happen to some of my work kids when I wasn't here? You know, just like that sense of responsibility was so overwhelming. And um, I was worried about how I was going to manage everything. What if I made a mistake? What if I didn't do something I was supposed to do? And um, I was crabby. I was irritable. I had very low tolerance for anything, you know, like my poor kids. Like I was crabby when I got home. I was tired, you know, um, overall negative. I had, you know, kind of a negative overall perspective of like humanity, really. Like that's all the world was, is like these you know, tough stories in these tough situations. And so what did I do? Like, I kind of figured out a way, got a new job, you know, and then kind of had to go through my own, you know, therapy and learning my own skills, managing some of these things. So, um, and, you know, through that, it's like when you're feeling compassion fatigue and burnout, it's like questioning, which I think we all do. And part of me feels like, um, it's good to question, you know, am I making a difference? Is what I'm doing, you know, helping someone? Is it doing something for the better? Um, but it's also like, are you questioning that to like do better? And because you're still motivated or are you doing it because you're feeling like nothing matters and like you're so down that, you know, you're not feeling like it's worth it. Um, so there's different ways to question yourself, but I think that, um, that those are very, um, those are my personal experiences with it, share it with the world that, you know, when you feel it coming on, it's like, um, you know, you need to, to do something to change. Um, and I hope a lot of people don't like quit their jobs or something, but I, cause I think that we're all in, you know challenging roles, but um, what can we do to make it better, which is what we're going to talk about coming up. Um, signs and symptoms. So kind of thinking about, like like you said, that difference between overworked and compassion fatigue, burnout, like the heavier kind of feeling of these things. Um, so physical, psychological, and emotional exhaustion, hopelessness, irritable, numb, um, detached and like not feeling like anything's fun, you know, um, I don't enjoy the usual things that I used to, um, and just constantly focusing on the negative and, um, thinking about suffering and the negative things that, um, are happening day to day, feeling anger towards events or people, um, blaming yourself. And, um, you know, I think that, you know, that sense of responsibility, um, that is overwhelming and, um, a s decreased sense of accomplishment, like, um, and then, you know, if you're changing, like kind of what I alluded to before, uh, a change in your worldview, you know, that, um, you know, that, that things are, you know, that negative outlook that um, you're focusing on negatively. Um, and then physical symptoms, you know, kind of those similar to like depression or um, anxiety, appetite, sleep disturbance, nausea, dizziness. Um, and just like anything, you know, the sooner you notice some of these signs, then you can start to care for yourself and restore yourself and do things to help yourself feel better. So going on with more signs of symptoms, kind of like breaking them up into categories, um, emotional, powerlessness, anxiety, um, survivor guilt, hypersensitivity, um, mood swings, emotional roller coaster, feeling overwhelmed, um, depleted energy, and then cognitive, which I think you know, it's interesting because we all kind of deal with things in a different way to help us um, deal with stress or different things. Um, being perfectionist, some of us kind of go one way or the other, like we have to do everything, you know, and be very specific about it, or we're just kind of like, whatever, you know, I'm not going to do it. So either you're spacing out or you're so fixated and focused on it. Um, 
self-doubt, um, minimalization. Um, so like you're kind of saying, oh, it's not, you know, a big deal or what have you. Um, behavioral being impatient, withdrawn, irritable, um, hypervigilance, accident prone. You're not really paying attention, losing things. I, I think of like disassociation a lot when um, talking about this. Um, and then spiritually, you know, questioning the meaning of life, feeling a loss of purpose, self-satisfaction, um, and questioning even your religious beliefs or the things that kind of comfort you. Um, and personal relationships, um, withdraw, mistrust, overprotective um, as a spouse or parent. I will say that too, you know, as a parent, you know, it definitely affected how I viewed, you know, protecting my kids and what was allowed and what was safe. And um, so loneliness, uh, physical, um, rapid heartbeat, body aches, dizziness, um, and then getting sick a lot, you know, when you're dealing with a lot of stress, then you tend to get sick a lot. Um, so what can we do? Taking care of yourself for a change. Imagine that, you know, um, setting limits, um, eating and drinking and sleeping well, boundaries, which we'll talk about more. Um, don't be a sponge, you know, taking in everything that is around you. And, you know, they talk about being an empathetic um, and, you know, taking, absorbing everything in. And um, we need to have our, our safe bubble and protect ourselves to um, take time off, talking to people and exercising, having physical activity. Um, so, and then this is a tool. I actually just did this last week and kind of um, assessed myself again, because I've done this multiple times, like over the past years. Um, and this is the um, professional quality of life assessment. And um, you go through and check the boxes and then it categorizes them um, along the different um sorry, the different um, categories of like um, compassion, satisfaction, burnout, and secondary traumatic stress. So they're assessing you on all of those things. And um, so it kind of helps you because, you know, with everything, it's like, okay, if I'm having a good day and I like my window of tolerance or my level of, you know, um, you know, strength um, is, is better that day. I'm like, okay, things are better. I'm doing good, you know? And then, you know, the next day I'm like, things are horrible. You know, it's been horrible, but you know, it just depends on your perspective at that moment. So kind of doing stuff like this kind of helps, um, take out, you know, some of that emotional, um, interjection and being able to kind of, you know, objectively look at it and be like, okay, is this, um, accurate overall, like thinking about like the past month or so. And um, so that's a good tool. And um, there's the website up there on that slide. So we can always put that in the um, chat box too, if you guys want to look at that, or you can just Google it. Um, and they have it in many different languages. So um, it can be a tool that you share with others. Um, and they do a lot of research. It's interesting. So healing from and coping with compassion fatigue. Um, so just more ideas, kind of similar things, you know, like if you're dealing with stress, like think um, the same tools, your coping tools, frequent breaks from the day, even if it's just for a few minutes um, and practicing meditation or, um, you know, just taking a few minutes to take, take some deep breaths. Um and taking your vacation time and pursuing hobbies. <laughs> this is one that I am not personally good at. I kind of show interest in a hobby and then it kind of fades out really quickly. And, um, but you know, the thought is there eating well, getting enough sleep, um, you know, all of like those healthy things that we need to do setting priorities with your time 
and um, disengaging from caregiving commitments. And so that kind of encompasses all of it, right? Like, so not only at work, but also home life. Like, it's not, you know, caregiving, like go out and have fun or do something that is not, you know, caregiving involved. <laughs> um, decide when to turn off, you know, phones, computers, email, so that um, you're not constantly, you know, being um, distracted, setting clear boundaries in both private and professional relationships. Getting into that a little bit more later too. Um, helping professionals research conclusions um, found in the study. So I, like I said, I had researched a little bit, trying to find like some more current um, information. And I did find um, a research study that was completed um, in I think it was 2021. So, and then it was like approved in 2022. And um, so it had 607 professional helpers. And so it included doctors, nurses, paramedics, teachers, psychologists, um, psychotherapists, social workers, police officers, and like priests or pastors. And um, it measured compassion, self-compassion, self-criticism, compassion fatigue and compassion satisfaction. So, um, and so kind of keeping in mind that this was during the pandemic, um, you know, it wasn't 2020, but it was like shortly thereafter. And um, what they found was that those with higher levels of compassion fatigue scored higher in self-criticism. So, um, you know, when you are feeling those senses of compassion fatigue, all of those symptoms that we talked about, then um, a lot of people are more critical, self-critical. And so that just kind of puts you down that, that rabbit hole of, you know, negativity. Um, and better learning to manage work time and workload assists in preventing compassion fatigue. Um, so having a balance, like I have, you know, some teammates, you know, I have cases and I have coworkers and teammates and we help each other. You know, if I have a lot going on, I'm like, Hey, you know, can you help me? I have to finish this. You're really good at this. You know, even if it's not their case, like we rely on each other and learning to ask for help. Um, and, um, being able to have that, um, kind of a relationship is really a blessing. Um, an important key to combat compassion fatigue is to reduce the negative self-talk and self-criticism. So, which um, we'll talk that, about that a little bit more too, um, and increasing more self-compassion. So give yourself a break, um, uh, reducing the likelihood of professional helper experiencing compassion fatigue is having more self-compassion. And, um, you know, how are you gonna, you know, be nice to others if you're not nice to yourself. Um, challenging negative thoughts. So down that rabbit, rabbit hole of negativity. Um, so some of the, you know, the, the ways of making sure that you are not, you know, adding to that snowball of negativity and, you know, being hard on yourself and experiencing those symptoms, just kind of checking in with yourself. Am I like sure that, you know, this is what's going on? Um, am I, you know, taking things too sense, like, am I being too sensitive? Am I misjudging the situation? Am I putting a different spin on it? Um, and then when you're having self negative thoughts to yourself about yourself, um, you know, is that something that I would say to a friend, you know, would you call someone that name or would you think negative thoughts about them like that? Like, I want to treat myself nicely and have say nice things to myself about myself. Um, and is it helpful? Is it a helpful thing to think, you know, is that hurtful or is it helpful? Just basic, you know, rules of self-care. Um, <laughs> We brought up compassion satisfaction. Um, so those, you know, working 
as a helper, um, there's also, you know, those really good feelings when you make that personal connection with someone or, you know, you're able to kind of understand someone or something about that, um, that individual that other people didn't pick up on, um, or, you know, just being able to have a good day and a joyful moment and connection. Um, those are all like really good and rewarding things that I, I get from, um, working with individuals and being a helper and, um, having, you know, good feelings with your coworkers and, um, yeah, just having, like, I feel like it's very meaningful and, um, I feel passionate about it. And so having that kind of satisfaction coming from work and focusing on those good things, you know, like those small wins, you know, sometimes it's like, oh, uh, like tough thing after tough after tough. And then it's like, oh, I had this really special moment with this, you know, client and it meant so much. And I'm like, I'm going to hang on to that. And I'm going to think about that when I'm down, you know, and um, just really trying to, to focus on those positive things. Um, celebrating the little wins and, um, so in providing guidance, right? Like helping others to, you know, I, we have some pretty complex clients that, you know, are nonverbal or, you know, have like specific needs and, um, it's taken a while for people to get to know them. And so being able to relay some of that information to help both the client to receive the care that they need and to help your coworker to be successful, you know, um, helping others, um, across the board and just knowing you're making someone's life better, you know, it's hanging on to those, those good thoughts. Um, this was a book that, um, I've been reading, um, and it's really interesting and really good. Um, and it's about boundaries. It's about, um, you know, it's, it's challenging. It's challenging to set those boundaries. Um, and I just really liked this quote, we can't create more time, but we can do less and we have to delegate, ask for help. And um, like, we have to prioritize, you know, what are, what are the main things that need to be done so that I'm not fully drained or, you know, feeling this sense of fatigue. Um, so learning boundaries and overcoming people pleasing, um, you know, a lot of us, I think in, you know, helper roles, we have a, a sense of, um, we lean towards the people pleasing side of things often. And, um, you know, it can be very draining to try, be trying to make everybody happy. And we have to learn to work, you know, more efficiently and um, with help and support. And, you know, if like you're having, you know, a very um, challenging time at work or, you know, you know, for a while, like when you're, if people are say going to work and in school or, you know, just having multiple things happening, then is there a way at home that other people can step in and you can kind of let go of some of that responsibility and be able to, um, to delegate, to share, share the responsibility with others and just um, trying to find ways that we can balance our lives where we have that control and um, sticking to it so that we're not draining ourselves dry. Um, and another thing that is very rewarding and fills, fills us up is personal growth. Um, finding certain things that you're passionate about, like we talked about hobbies earlier or, you know, continued education, um, about whatever, you know, anything, um, uh, attending workshops, classes, reading more books, um, and just also awareness of like your environment personally, who are you letting around you? Who is, um, in your life? Um, is it draining you or is it, um, supporting you? So, um, as far as relationships, that goes back to kind of some of those boundaries of, um, is it balanced? You know, are you just taking care of them or are they also taking care of you and, um, nurturing yourself, you know, emotional, social, physical, intellectual, and spiritual, um, 
being a caregiver and natural helper. Um, like I said, we are um, tend to sometimes be people pleasers. And so sometimes people take advantage of us. And um, so we learning those boundaries, those um, ways of protecting ourselves um, can be very important for our sustained, you know, health and happiness and uh, making sure that we're caring for ourselves and surrounding ourselves with others who care for us. Um, I just found this visual that I thought was really great. And I think that I will print it out and use it with um, different clients and stuff. Um, so different coping skills. So kind of categorizing it off that um, redirecting your attention towards positive. So kind of, um, you know, I think cognitive behavioral therapy, thinking of like, how do we um, kind of change our focus, right? So um, in, engaging in activities that give us a break, that get our mind off of things. Um, and there's some different ideas here for things. Um, grounding and mindfulness when... Um, you're um, able to bring yourself, you know, back into your body when, um, you know, they do the five, four, three, two, one, the senses. Um, if you're feeling out of sorts, like say you're at work and you're feeling overwhelmed or, you know, you're starting to feel that those symptoms like that fatigue and, you know, recognizing that in yourself and being like, I need to take a minute, you know, run your hands under some cold water, um, go take a drink of water, you know, go and um, go outside and take a fresh, a breath of fresh air, you know, do something in that moment and get yourself reset, you know, because if you just keep going and ignoring it and ignoring it, then you're going to burn yourself out. So that's kind of, you got to step in there and take care of yourself. And that's, you know, it goes back to um, what at least we are always telling our clients, you know, we want them to stop, you know, certain challenging behaviors or, you know, expressing them, themselves in kind of these, you know, unhealthy, negative ways. It goes for us too. We have to do the same thing. Otherwise we can't help people like we want to. So, um, but this, you know, I think that um, Danielle sent out the slides, but this is on there and I just thought it was really nice and I liked how it was laid out. So, and kind of um, categorized. So yeah, thought challenging, emotional awareness, opposite action, um, and social interaction. Those are all good things, um, that you can do. Um, my coworker, um, Rachel, she, she let me borrow this book. She got it when she was in school. And, um, I really thought it was interesting uh, regarding self-care and it kind of breaks things down, um, into different categories, social, physical, intellectual, vocational, spiritual and emotional. And, um, you know, it had, has a lot of really interesting information. And I think it's important to, you know, we think about self-care, you know, um, a lot of people think, you know, like coping skills and things like Netflix and chill or drinking a glass of wine or, you know, yeah, you do you and what is, um, helps you to relax and take your mind off of things. Um, but being able to look and be like, am I hitting all of these boxes? Like, am I really, you know, considering all of these aspects of who I am and taking good care of myself? <clears throat> so um, I recommend checking it out. And, you know, if not, you know, um, at least just think about that socially, like who are you surrounding yourself with and who, you know, brings out the light, you know, in you and like replenishes you, who would you laugh with and have the most fun with physical exercise, intellectual book reading, talking about ideas, um, vocational. So yes, work life balance, um, spiritual, of course, if there's, you know, something that, um, brings you peace and comfort or an emotional, you know, go to therapy, talk to your friends, talk journal, you know, do different things. So, um, 
yeah, hitting all of those boxes. Um, so the small things, oh, yeah, okay. The small things that help. So as, you know, kind of touched on counseling, um, exercise, going out, you know, with your friends. I'm big on naps. I love taking naps. I could take a nap probably at any time of the day. <laughs> um, take a day off. And now that the kids are back in school, you can take a day off and not have them home. <laughs> so it's even better. Um, getting a haircut, sometimes that can really like help you feel better. Um, just things, you know, whatever it is that helps you feel better going for a walk out in nature. Um, and one of my favorite things that, um, you know, just challenging yourself, going on a new adventure, having a new experience and, um, being like, okay, like I haven't done something by myself in a long time. Like, what are you made of now? Like, you know, I haven't, um, there's many different things going to a movie by yourself, going out to dinner by yourself or, you know, um, things that are uncomfortable, sometimes pushing yourself to do something that's uncomfortable can be really good for you <laughs> and not just, you know, physically exercise, but like awkward socially. <laughs> so, um, things to think about and, um, yeah. So would people share some of your um, self-care strategies and like what works for you? Hiking, therapy, laying down in silence. I'm with you. Art projects. Love that. Gardening, painting, animals. Oh yeah. Totally animals. Listening to music. Hiking, getting your nails done. Ooh, paddle boarding. That sounds awfully fun. Uh, puppy, taking her for a walk. Totally napping. Yes. Found my people here. Um, pampering yourself with spa days. That sounds lovely. Uh, reading, journaling, horses. Awesome. Yoga, exercise. Love it. Going to the gym. Um, kayaking, photography. Yeah. I mean, all of, yes. Spending times with friends and napping. Yep. <laughs> Grandkids. Awesome. Yeah. Word games. Totally. I do. I play games on my phone too. That's yep. Getting your mind off of stuff and just kind of doing that camping. Love that. I try to take my PTO often. That's good. Love it. Hi, Danielle. We had someone ask about um, how do you deal with putting the client's world on your shoulders as a QIDP when the person who is mainly responsible for the majority of the client's care is the QIDP? Um, so I don't know if you can speak a little bit about that. It seems to, to be intertwined with the whole boundaries um, that you were talking about earlier. Absolutely. Um, so I totally feel that, um, I think that one of the things to keep in mind is like, it's a shared responsibility. I know that as like the kind of primary role that you have, um, the overall care, health, emotional, you know, making sure that all of like the, um, physical health things are in order like that's it's a lot and you have a lot of people to manage that with and um i think that like delegating um and prioritizing um and also i think hopefully you have like a great supervisor or someone to talk to and vent to and help with and sometimes um, that that really can help to reassure that, you know, you are doing a good job or making the right choices. And that that's something, I don't know, personally with me, with my, my team and my colleagues that I work with, um, you know, talking with them and getting that reassurance and that guidance, you know, kind of staffing cases and, you know, sharing ideas and things that can be really, really helpful. Um, but also, yeah, the boundary piece of, 
And I think that that takes work. That's like an everyday challenge of, um, okay, I'm going to shut off my phone or, you know, or maybe you can't, maybe you're on call or like, they're always, you know, able to reach you. Um, but trying to like have any level of boundaries that you can have with, um, your private time and your time away and being able to, um, mentally, and it might be that you have to mentally force yourself for a while until you get used to doing it to shut yourself off from having your thoughts go in that direction about work. And every time you think about work, kind of shifting yourself back and being like, nope, you know, I'm not going to go there. Like this is time that I'm going to focus on my family, myself, you know, my hobby, whatever it is, and not letting yourself go there. Um, I think it's really challenging. Um, but I also, you know, I, I think that that's, it just shows like that level of dedication and care, um, where you feel that sense of responsibility. So, um, but I hope that that kind of answers your question a little bit and, um, yeah, that's tough, but I think, you know, yeah, all of those things, those are what I think would help. Um, Okay, so types of rest. So um, kind of going along with the same kind of um, ideas as um, the book that I just shared, um, physical rest, you know, and I like this, it's, it shares kind of some ideas of signs that you need it, you know, um, a lack of physical energy or you're getting sick. So take a nap, you know, you need, you need extra sleep. You need to rest. You need to rest your whole body, um, mental rest. Um, when you're feeling foggy, irritable, um, not able to focus. Um, so getting your times to black out, um, distractions, meditate, listen to music. Um, and that's part of that challenge is like not letting your thoughts interfere and take that mental rest away from you. Um, emotional rest, um, excess, excessive worry, self-doubt, um, overwhelmed by other people's drama. Yeah. That's that. Don't be a sponge, right? Um, don't take it in and, and carry it as your own. Um, avoid comparing yourself to others, go to therapy, remove emotional drains like toxic relationships, um, spiritual rest, lacking motivation, happiness, hopelessness, decrease in satisfaction, I think in life in general and how to get it, practice gratitude, um, volunteer, find ways to have purpose in your life and then practicing your religion and what brings you comfort. Social rest, um, feeling alone, um, detached from people, drained um, when you're with people, getting, yeah, one-on-one -on -one time with someone who fills you up, where there's that reciprocation, not just draining you out. Um, space from anyone who drains you. Um, join a group or club of like, minded people and sensory rest feeling eye fatigue or strain yes um can't smell or taste as well it's kind of like i think of like sensory you know especially with all of the folks that we work with you know just that overwhelm you know it's like okay you know i i was seeing something i saw something the other day about when um you're driving and you need to concentrate so you turn like the music off or um and people always joke about that like you're trying to see better and so you turn the music off but i'm like yes that's exactly me <laughs> like i totally do that because i'm like there's too much sensory input i need to focus i need less sensory distraction it totally makes sense to me um so taking time away from all devices. Like someone had mentioned laying down in a quiet, dark room for absolutely like such a sensory relief, um, taking whatever bothers you away, um, closing your eyes, having creative rest. So um, 
So if you have no free time in your day, back-to-back schedule, um, struggle with brainstorming ideas, can't see the beauty and awe in nature. That's interesting. Um, yeah, taking how to get it, take a big vacation and a small breaks. Um, yeah. <laughs> Um, spend carefree time outside, read, dance, and go to shows. Yeah. And I'm going to add in there my idea of doing something <clears throat> that makes you feel challenged, like the idea of doing something alone socially or um, doing something that you've never done before, because I think that that is really challenging, but also meaningful and helpful. Um, so. This was another quote from the writer and professor, Audre Lorde. Um, I've come to believe that caring for myself is not self-indulgent. Caring for myself is an act of survival. And I think that that is um, especially true for all of us in helping jobs. And um, we need to kind of take all that into consideration, right? Um, throughout our whole careers. And, um, of course, Mr. Rogers, you know, you, you just, um, the famous quote when he was a boy and you would see scary things in the news, his mom would say to look for the helpers. And so that's kind of focus on the positive, look for the good in the world and you are good in the world, you're a helper and you're making the world a better place. And through the ups and downs and the hard times that, um, we all have, um, Sometimes we all focus on the negative, but um, we can help each other to kind of turn turn away and look at the more positive things and find, you know, what to be grateful for. And so thank you for being a compassionate caregiver. And um, I hope that you recognize how important you are to those you serve. Um, and then here's like some of the resources. So, yeah. Thank you so much, Katie. I think this is a yeah. great reminder for everyone. Um, and I love all of the the resources that you provided. We've had a lot of a lot of talk and chit chat in in the the um the chat box about people's jobs and roles and you know the burnout that they're experiencing. Um, and everyone's very appreciative of the resources that you have provided. Um, and I think it's just a, it's a good reminder of the things that we need to focus on, right? Um, we can only focus on the things that we're in control of, and it's often so hard when we're overwhelmed. Um, but, you know, what are the small things that we can do with intent um, to make our lives a little easier, right? Um, I am not seeing any, um, any questions. I don't think, uh, like I said, there's a lot of chat to get through. Um, I'm not seeing any questions. Um, but just as a reminder to everyone, so the presentation was sent out prior to um, the actual webinar. If you did not receive that, you can shoot me an email. Um, again, I'll put that into the chat box. Um, hopefully, technology is working great. And after this webinar, um, once I sync everything, you guys will get that post-exam. Um, that It'll come as a survey, but it needs to be completed um, in order to receive your certificate. So that will come to the email address that you are registered with. Um, hopefully that'll come today. Um, if not, give it a couple of days um, just so we can get all of those kinks out um, that we have been experiencing. Um, I think that is it. Like I said, I'm not seeing anything else um, other than... Um, just a thank you, Katie. Um, everyone is very appreciative. Um, wonderful, wonderful information. So um, thank you everyone for joining us. And thank you, Katie, for um, spending your afternoon uh, providing us with all your knowledge. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Take care. We hope everyone has a great rest of your day.